Smooth colors. Present arms. And now the national anthem will be sung by Mr. George Rios. Center for Puritan Studies, 
and it's a great pleasure to uh, be here today and to welcome you. Uh, this is an event that we're sharing with our community, and I think is, uh, as far as I can tell, the first time that Centro sponsors, co-sponsors an event with such wonderful military organizations, veteran organizations. Forty years ago, on February 26, 1973, CUNY officially opened the operations of the Center for Puerto Rican Studies with the announcement of the appointment of Fran Bonilla as its first director. A few years later, the echelon of what is today the Central Library and Archives was created. For 40 years, Central has been preserving the legacy and heritage of the Puerto Rican community in the United States and serving the faculty and students of Hunter College, CUNY, and our community more generally. In our new home here in El Barrio, the Central Library and Archives is only getting better. Uh, Central, for those of you who no, don't know much about us, is first and foremost what I will call a, a think tank, a research center dedicated to the study and interpretation of the Puerto Rican experience in the United States and produces, disseminates relevant interdisciplinary research. Central also collects, preserves, and provides access to library resources documenting Puerto Rican history and culture. We promote the sharing of the Puerto Rican experience through cultural and educational activities. We produce educational materials for teachers and younger generations to learn about their past, empower them to change the present, and shape a better future for our community. Today we gather at the Central Library and Archives to celebrate our veterans. They are among many who have carried the torch with honor and helped build and sustain the Puerto Rican heritage and pride. We are giving a special recognition tonight to veterans from the 65th Infantry, Samuel Vasquez Deza, Rafael Cordero, Eugenio Quevedo. We also honor veterans from the Vietnam War, Joseph Delgado, Rafael Morales, Hector Resto, Raul Rodriguez, and Ray Ramos. As part of our 40th anniversary celebration, Central will also pay a special tribute to the donations of the organizational records of the 65th uh, Honor Task Force, represented by church chairman and very good friend, uh, Mr. Anthony Millet. And two veterans who are donating their papers to the library and archives, Jim Carr, an Army uh, Reserve Civil Affairs Officer and Brigade Commander, who did combat zone deployments in the Middle East, Latin America, and Europe, and Colonel Mar Maritza Sainz Ryan, a United States Army officer and the head of the Department of Law at the United States Military Academy. Welcome you both. Uh, they have accepted to become part of the 100 Puerto Ricans. Why are we honoring them? Who are those 100 Puerto Ricans that we're talking about? Okay. There are 100 individuals or organizations who have made a difference in our communities and will contribute their paper to the Central Archives. As contributors to the archives, they will be among the greatest, among other pioneers who helped build our institutions and communities, among others who have also changed history. Their legacy will be preserved for generations to come. Scholars will study their legacy and younger generations will appreciate their heritage. It is my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Harry Frankie Rivera. Dr. Frankie, a historian, where are you, Harry? Oh, okay, come to the front, please. Uh, Dr. Frankie, a historian by training, specializes in the US and Puerto Rico military history. He is currently a research associate at Centro. He has worked on the history of the 65th Infantry for the past decade and on the experience of the Puerto Rican soldier in the U.S. military. He's and very young, as you can see. He is currently working on a book on the experience of the 65th Infantry during the Korean War and the meaning of the regiment for island and state-based Puerto Ricans. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Frankie Rivera. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you. Thanks for having me. I want to say a few words on the experience, not just uh, the Puerto Rican soldiers on the, um, in the United States Armed Forces, but I, I think that it's worth to recognize um, <clears throat> that, uh, sorry, it's worth to, uh, noticing that before the United States took over the island uh, in 1898, Puerto Ricans have had a long history of military service. Under Spain, Puerto Rican militias uh, have been the backbone of the island's defenses, 
until the 1870s when uh, they were disbanded. And for all means and purposes, Puerto Rican stopped serving in the military. It's not until right after the Spanish-American War of 1898 that Puerto Ricans start once more to serve in the military, this part in the United States Armed Forces. Um, what we can tell <coughs> from a postcard from the War Department is um, that what was created was referred to as the American Colonial Army and intended for defense and policing of the island, the Battalion of Puerto Rican Volunteers had duties only in the island and for all purposes were considered colonial troops and there were only a few hundred Puerto Ricans serving at a given time. It's not until World War I that Puerto Ricans are accepted in mass into the armed forces and mobilized for war, even though the War Department <coughs> preferred not to mobilize Puerto Ricans whom it did not trust as combat troops. Uh, regardless of objections and regardless of obstacles, some 18,000 Puerto Ricans served in the armed forces during World War I. Most of them served in what came to be known as the Puerto Rican contingent to the National Army or the Puerto Rican Division. Others served as part of the Puerto Rican Regiment, who would soon, who would soon become the 65th Infantry. Others, drafted or joining while living in the United States, served in continental units and would be sent to white or, the way it was referred at the time, colored units. Among them, Rafael Hernandez, one of our brightest uh, music composers. The Puerto Rican Division was raised and trained in Puerto Rico in Camp Las Casas, and after the war, provided the manpower for the newly minted Puerto Rico National Guard. The Puerto Rican Regiment, which was sent to the Panama Canal area during World War I, was renamed after the war as the 65th United States Infantry, and came to be known in the island as El 65. Yeah. <laughs> it is worth to mention. 65 Infanteria. It is worth to mention that the 65th was not a National Guard unit, but a component of the United States Army since its inception in 1899. And as such, it was a segregated unit, and we have to recognize this. During World War II, this is going to be really important because over 58,000 Puerto Ricans served in the Armed Forces of the United States during the Second World War. Um, during this war, the 65th was sent to Panama, the continental United States, and finally, North Africa and Europe. As mentioned by their beloved commander during the Korean War, Colonel William Harris, in World War II, the War Department did not trust Puerto Rican collectively and kept the Puerto Rican units out of the important theaters of war, which deprived them from seeing real action during World War II. So you had the strange case of soldiers willing to join the fight and an establishment that did not trust their combat ability due to racial prejudice of the era. Nonetheless, the Puerto Rican soldiers did their duty, either in Europe or North Africa as part of the 65th, or as part of the Puerto Rica, uh, the Puerto Rico National Guard, which took over um, garrison duties throughout the Caribbean and Central America. And even as individual Puerto Ricans joining uh, the armed forces, joining the fight in, sorry, joining the fight in the United States, and again, being sent to either white or black units. It's really worth noticing that one of the or original and famous flying tigers was a Puerto Rican. And many of the instructors uh, who trained the famous Tuskegee Airmen were Puerto Rican aviators. I'm mentioning all this because when the Korean War started, this is going to be really important. It is exactly because the military of the 1940s and 50s considered non-white people as inferior and unfit for combat that fighting in the next war as first-line combat troops would be so important. When the Korean War started in 1950, Puerto Rican has spent half a century demanding the right to fight. Until that, po until that point, in some way or another, such right had been denied. The Korean War helped to change all that. Because of the lack of manpower, the insistence of President Truman in the segregating the armed forces, and the readiness and fitness for combat that El 65 demonstrated in the Vieques exercise Operation Portrait, the Borinqueneers were sent to, to the Korean War very early and a first-line combat troops. 
they were still untrusted. But the men of the 65th proved their critics wrong, wrong and soon accumulated an outstanding combat record. And they came to be identified by the enemy, nonetheless, as a unit not to be trifled with. The Puerto Rican soldier in Korea served under his duty. And in the process, the 65th became a national icon. On October 12, 1950, uh, Puerto Rico learned that the 65th was fighting in Korea. Once the news got out, the day came to resemble a holiday more than, uh, sorry, more than anything else. The island's newspapers were full of stories and pictures of the 65th and the ceremonies held previous to their departure. The private sector joined the chorus with paid advertisement wishing the 65th a prompt return and exhorting the Puerto Rican soldier to uphold ideals of democracy and freedom. In leading newspapers, the tone was the same. One proclaimed, and I quote, as it was yet another symbol of the United Nations under the American flag flies the flag of the 65th Infantry Regiment. This flag flies today in Korea, end of quote. And according to the editorial, and I quote again, the color of the 65th represent not only the regiment of Puerto Rico fighting alongside the peace-loving nations of the world, end of quote. The island media reminded Puerto Ricans that they, what they were fighting for, another quote, this regiment goes again overseas in defense of our nation's freedom, asserted El Imparcial. When political leaders and the press issue a call for fighting in defense of the nation, Puerto Ricans responded en masse. On several occasions, the military authorities in Puerto Rico had to announce that they did not need more volunteers. Even when the war had turned to a bloody stalemate and long list of casualties appear almost every week in the Puerto Rican press, the recruiting stations never lacked volunteers. About 61,000 Puerto Ricans served in the United States Armed Forces during the Korean War. Over, over 43,000 served with the 65th. Of that later group, over 39,000, or roughly 91%, were volunteers. They suffered 3,540 casualties, 747 of them killed in action. The soldiers killed in action received full military burdens in Puerto Rico, many of which Governor Luis Muñoz Marín attended. The wounded were welcomed home as heroes. Avenues and plazas were named in honor of the regiment, while monuments went up to commemorate the dead. The shield of the 65th was painted on all the public buses and train cars in the capital. The press followed and sometimes even hyperbolized the exploits of the 65th. As the war continued, however, and the nature of the war changed from one of movement to one of attrition, things changed for the men of the 65th. The 65th would face almost insurmountable odds in the autumn of 1952, and during the battles of, for Outpost Kelly and Jackson High, it would suffer massive casualty, and some of his company would essentially disintegrate under fire. Instead of finding what troll and hindered the 65th performance, the military instead blamed the soldier and called Marshal 94 <coughs> Puerto Ricans. This gave us a shock to the 65th, to the men of the 65th, and Puerto Ricans in the island and the United States. What I started as a glorious page ended in shame as the war near its end, and the 65th was desegregated and the excess Puerto Rican personnel sent to other units. The bitter ex this late bitter experience was partly responsible for the apparent amnesia that took over Puerto Rico after the war when it came to El 60 to El 65. From being a national icon, El 65 and the veterans were quickly forgotten, to the point that as a kid, you could be playing next to one of the monuments erected to one of the soldiers of the Korean War or drive down La 65 de Infanteria without knowing for whom it was named or whom did it honor. That started to shame in the last 10 years or so, or so as a group of researchers and concerned private citizens, usually intrigued by picture of relatives in, uni in uniform, asked the question, Tío, Abuelo, Papa, why are you in uniform in that picture? And thus, they became interested in recovering the history of our soldiers. Thanks to their efforts, there is much more awareness nowadays about the role and experience of our soldiers during the Korean War than it was a decade after the war ended. <coughs> and even as we speak, there is a campaign to secure the Congressional Gold Medal for the 65th Infantry. It is for the reason that we want to thank and honor uh, 
people were honored today for because they are helping us to recover and preserve the history of our soldiers. But above all, we want to recognize the service and sacrifices of our service men and women who more often than not have had to work on obstacles to carry out their duty. I want to leave you on a brighter note. We know that in 1954, the 65th Infantry returned to Puerto Rico and it was reconstituted as an old Puerto Rican unit, soon to be deactivated in 1956. The study of the 65th, however, did not end in 1956. Colonel Cesar Cordero, who had commanded the 65th in 1952, and Governor Luis Muñoz Marin led an active campaign that culminated with the reactivation and transfer of the 65th from the regular army to the Puerto Rico National Guard. In 1959, the regiment uncased its colors and became part of the 92nd Puerto Rico National Guard Infantry Brigade, where it continued to serve even to this day. We know that at times of war, National Guard units are federalized and calling to active service. The history of the 65th is so unique that as the 65th passed from the regular army to the Puerto Rico National Guard, it made history. This was and still is the only time in which a federal unit, a unit of the regular United States Army, became nationalized. And Puerto Rico got back and kept alive its beloved regiment. Thank you. we'd like to present the honorees. In our event tonight, we're going to do things a little different than the military. We're, we're not going to go by rank. Tonight, we have the privilege to have members of the 65th Infantry Regiment, and we would like to first recognize them, the members of the 65th, and, and to represent them is the chair Tony Mele, um, the chair of the Infantry Honor Task Force. Let me call their names. Other special guests who have, I'm sorry, other special guests who are here amongst us today are veterans of the Vietnam War and who have also co agreed to contribute to our archives. Please rise as I call your names. Members of the 65th Infantry Honor Task Force, please rise. Rafael Coldero. Mr. Eugenio Quevedo, please stand. <laughs> the pin that we're giving these <laughs> the pin that we're giving these soldiers today is because they have either agreed or they have already signed papers to donate some or all of their documents, their personal documents or memorabilia to our library and archives. Thank you. Next we have Samuel Vasquez Deza. Thank <laughs> you. 
Members of the Vietnam War, Mr. Joseph Delgado. Mr. Rafael Morales. Infantry Honor Task Force dedicated to the recognition of unsung heroes and veterans of past wars. He has been called upon to provide congressional testimony and was recognized by New York City Council, the Office of the Mayor, and the Governors of New York and Puerto Rico for his efforts. Mr. Mele was decorated for valor by the U.S. Army, was a nominee for the White House Fellowship Program and receives special recognition awards from the U.S. Congress, U.S. Secret Service, U.S. Marshal, and a presidential appointment as a Selective Service Local Board Member for the Hudson Valley in New York. Please welcome Thank you. This is such a great turnout. I'd like to thank Centro and everyone who helped make this possible. You know, when you talk about unsung heroes, they're only unsung if we don't sing the song. And with all these Puerto Ricans in the house, how, how, may, how can we not sing the praises of these veterans? So it's, uh, it's a good thing that we're all here together. 
And what's extremely important is that we preserve, protect, and uh, re keep close to our hearts the pristine history of what these men did. Why do we honor them today? Why do we honor them as individuals? Why do we honor them as soldiers? Because they have the blood of our fathers flowing through them. They, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And it's because of what they did back then that we are able to do what we do here today. And so when I hear about their history, I'm swelled with pride. And I hope that someday in the future, when, when future scholars study their history, they do not forget that what they did. And let me, let me remind us of one thing that I think that was omitted in their history. In February of 1951, the 65th Infantry Regiment, with two battalions and three days of battle, engaged the 149th Chinese Division. Now, if, if, if some of you don't know the difference between a division and a battalion, that's like the difference between 10 to 1 odds. It was 1,000 men against 10,000. And during the course of that battle, the 65th Infantry Regiment of Puerto Rico heard the order to fix bayonets. And they fixed bayonets. And 1,000 men charged 10,000. And the battle was brutal. The battle came down to hand to hand. The battle also was, wrote their history in blood. And so when we talk about the distinction of the 65th Infantry Regiment, it is not only about their ethnicity. It's not only about the awards and honors and accolades that, that we give to them but it was what they represent to Puerto Rican manhood. And lest anyone ever forget what Puerto Rican manhood is, these men represented that to us. And when we hear about uh, stories of them being segregated, this was true because this was the time of the era until the Korean War, which was the dividing line. Because in 1948, President uh, Harry Truman signed a desegregation order. And they showed up in, in uh, the Korean War, as you know, during the 50s. So unless there was some captain who had more rank than the President of the United States, this unit was not segregated. They were an all Puerto Rican unit because of their character and training and, and cohesion. They came from Puerto Rico. If they came from Texas, they'd be an all Texas unit. But they came from Puerto Rico. <laughs> and that's who they are for us. <laughs> it's my distinct honor and pedigree in that my great-grandfather, Leoncio Beauchamp, was one of those World War I Port, uh, 65th Infantry Regiment soldiers who helped found the regiment, who helped find its voice, and helped establish them as American soldiers, and brought about their unique American Puerto Rican character. And so when I look around this room, it's my honor to represent these men. And what I'd just like to do for the moment is recognize some of them who are here. Can the 65th Infantry Honor Task Force members stand up, please? Tommy Lopez, Ms. Podrosa, Senor Montalvo, Vasquez, Martinez, Mr. Velez, and look around the room. There he is, Maxa Rivera. It's my honor to represent them here today. We've been associated together for 13 years when we first established this honor task force. And what we made clear to the United States government, and what we made clear to everyone else who forgot these soldiers, is that the Puerto Rican people are poor people, but we are a proud people. And we are rich in our heritage. We are rich in our culture. We are rich in the pride that we hold for our families and these soldiers. And be it known that we do not beg for the Congressional Gold Medal. We earned it. We earned it. We don't beg for medals. And metallurgy is not a measure of valor. Valor and courage are things of the heart, not things of metallurgy. So whether we get a medal or don't get a medal is of inconsequence to us. Because we earned it. And these men here earned it. And those who are left on the battlefield is where the glory was. And that's where we don't seek glory. Glory was found on the battlefield. And if you want to know where our glory is, the glory is through the remainders of these men who are here with us today and the soldiers we left on that battlefield that we are honoring here today. So I thank you and I appreciate all of you. Today. The 65th Honor Task Force, if you look us up on the internet, we were established as a coalition 
of veterans groups and individual groups from around the country. We, it began it as an idea in 1999. When the idea of, of uh, Bobby, what are these pictures are about, I found an old picture of my great grandfather and, understand, and I wanted to know what that was about. I wrote a letter to the governor of Puerto Rico and I asked the question, why are these Korean War veterans not being recognized and something should be done? I received a letter back from the governor of Puerto Rico and he said, that's a good idea, do it. <laughs> Never volunteer for anything. <laughs> 13 years later. <laughs> 13 years later, here we are. <laughs> and here we are, right? And these men have been with us all these 13 years. So it's a matter of passing on the torch. And the torch was passed from them to me. And now I pass the torch on from me to you and to this centro and that other young scholars in the future will come and keep that torch burning alive. So again, I thank you for your efforts and recognition. If we, if, if we could take just another moment, Senator Bill Larkin, career war veteran. He's a New York, New York State Senator. When he was in the Korean War, he knew about the 65th Infantry Regiment. He knew of their reputation, of their valor, and when I told him that we needed a little help in recognizing them, he was first and foremost to step up. He helped us, he helped us support the Borinqueneers stamp, poster stamp. He is also signing up behind us to uh, recommend that they receive the Congressional Gold Medal. And to some of the veterans here today, he extends his warm wishes. And if we just take a moment to recognize the veterans that came out here, we know it's going to be past their bedtime soon. <laughs> so if we could just take a moment. Mr. Bella, would you help me out? Mr. Bella's, uh, Ray, Ray Jr.'s father was in the 65th Infantry Regiment. You also received this recognition from Senator Larkin, in which he recognizes the 65th Infantry Regiment soldier. Among these, I'm going to go right down the line. Linda Pedrosa, please. You know who you are. Tommy Lopez, Montavo. Very nice. Yeah, bring them up. That's like, bring them all up. I say, bring them up. Where are you? Yeah, bring them up. Let's Just take, take a group. Let's do one for the You guys don't mind me taking a picture with these guys, right? No. Hey, hey, two, hey, two, hey, two. Hey, hey, two. Hey, This man is living history. Isaac Rivera right here, I'll tell you about. Isaac Rivera was one of the soldiers who fought at Kelly Hill. He fought at Jackson Heights. He'll tell you there were no cowards that day. There were men who charged up that hill. There were no cowards that day.
including service as Dean of the EPA Institute as Director of Training and Education Programs. He had a parallel career as an Army Reserve, as a Civil Affairs Officer full Colonel, and a Brigade Commander, where he did combat zone deployments in the Middle East, Latin America, and Europe. As a CA officer, he specialized in putting broken governments back together in places such as Kuwait and Panama, and in providing humanitarian service overseas, working closely with the US Agency for International Development, the State Department, and non-government organizations, such as the International Committee on the Red Cross, the International Rescue Committee, Jim is the National Historian of the Hispanic War Veterans of America and is currently working on completing a book on Arlington National Cemetery. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Jim Carr. Mention, uh, I was actually born and raised about 10 blocks from here. <laughs> so this is home. Welcome home. Thank you. My wife is uh, Mexican American and she's uh, really wondering what's going on with all these crazy Puerto Ricans. <laughs> this is part of my life. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, my mother passed away this, this, this past year. She would have been 95. She was the first Puerto Ricanian to work for the Treasury Department in, uh, in New York, and I was very, very proud of her. And my Uncle Charlie in Ponce, Puerto Rico, passed away this past year as well. He, was 90, he would have been 96. He was a very proud veteran and a Borinquenier. Yeah. I want to very briefly mention Arlington National Cemetery. Historically, uh, there was a, there's been a website devoted to the history of the cemetery. And in the history section, they have the section for African Americans, 
Japanese Americans, Jewish Americans, women, but they had no section for Hispanos or Puerto Ricanos. I wrote a letter to the superintendent of the cemetery and I copied all of the members of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus who were veterans or who served on the Armed Services Committee in the House. I got a call inviting me to meet with the cemetery officials and it took them about a nanosecond to realize A, I knew my Hispanic history and B, I knew my military history. So they took every recommendation I gave them in terms of people to be honored and they are now on the website. And there's an Hispanic section on the official Arlington National Cemetery website, which includes some Puerto Ricanos, including Maria Inez Ortiz, who was an army nurse who was killed in Iraq, uh, Umber Aroque Versace, a Medal of Honor recipient whose mother uh, wrote the book on which the television series The Flying Nun was based. In, in the year 2000, I attended a ceremony at Arlington National Cemetery in honor of the 50th anniversary of the Korean War. And the ceremony was specifically to dedicate a plaque for the Borinquineers. Some of you may have been there. And I was actually one of the last two people to leave the ceremony. Trying not to get emotional. <laughs> this is difficult. Kneeling to my left was an elderly gentleman in a Korean War era uniform. And I looked at his fruit salad. I looked at the ribbons he was wearing above his left breast pocket. And he was wearing the Distinguished Service Cross, the second highest award for valor given by the Army, second only to the Medal of Honor. And it was, of course, the last living Puerto Ricanio DSC recipient, Modesto Cartagena. And what I remember was how unpretentious and down-to-earth and humble he was. And uh, I love the Army, but uh, Modesto Cartagena should have received the Medal of Honor. Let, let me say that again. Modesto Cartagena should have received the Medal of Honor. Back then, as you know, there was an unofficial po policy in Korea that uh, Puerto Ricanos would not receive the Medal of Honor unless they died. And uh, unofficial policy, but uh, so, so I, I just want to go on record as once more supporting uh, efforts. It's, it's unfortunately, unfortunate that we give awards sometimes posthumously. Uh, it's better to give it when the folks are still alive. Uh, and I want, to, I want you to know how extremely honored I am to be here today uh, with Bernie Guineers and fellow uh, Puerto, uh, Puerto Rican veterans. And I salute you. was born in Manhattan to Spanish and Puerto Rican parents. Upon graduating from the United States Military Academy at West Point in 1982, she was commissioned as a lieutenant in the field artillery. During her tour with the <clears throat> excuse me, 1st Armored Division, Zimdorf, Germany, she was selected for 
the Judge Advocate General's Funded Legal Education Program. Oh, that was long. Colonel Ryan returned stateside to attend Vanderbilt University Law School and received her Juris Doctorate Order of the Cloth in 1988. Please join me in welcoming Colonel Ryan. soldier myself, I recognize that I'm standing between the troops and their chow, and it's Puerto Rican cuisine. So uh, despite the fact that I am an attorney on a JAG, I will be brief. And just let me simply say, I'm here to represent uh, Puerto Rican womanhood. And it is true that my mother is a Sevillana, and I wish she were here today, she's down in Florida, but at least she had the good taste and judgment to marry a Puerto Rican man, who was my father. And, um, <laughs> and my, uh, and my step, stepfather as well, and both of, both of whom are deceased, but I know that if they were here tonight, they would be very, very proud. But I will say this, uh, not only is your, is your valor inspiring to me in the stories of your courage, in the most difficult circumstances, but as is still evident today, uh, the camaraderie that you all enjoy with each other, the sense of humor that you've maintained, that dark sense of humor that was forged through those difficult times, is something that inspires us all. And uh, you've really got me uh, juiced up today. I'm, I'm ready to go, and I'm, I am uh, so honored uh, to be on the stage with these fine gentlemen. And uh, I am ready to commit myself as one of the, the Puerto Rican 100, which is extremely, uh, it's, it's awe-inspiring uh, to, to be mentioned in, in, the, in that number to do what I can uh, to publicize, to speak about, to carry on, to tell the story of particularly the 65th, the fighting 65th, and the pride that all Puerto Ricans should have in you and uh, in all our, our uh, service members today who carry on the banner that you so proudly carry. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to be here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to briefly um, now read some of the names of the founding members of the 65th Infantry Honor Task Force. Some of us are here tonight. Most have passed away. I'm also going to read out some names that some family members here in the audience have given to me. So, so please bear with me. Uh, let us recognize them for their dedication to duty, their community, and their contribution to this great country. Modesto Cartagena, Antonio Rodriguez Salinas, Angel Pagan, Agustin Ramirez, Anthony Melendez, Tomas Lopez, Eugenio Quevedo, Samuel Vasquez, Juan Carrión, Rafael Cordero, Eladio Cordero, José Ernesto Cordero, Luis Quiñones, Israel Quiñones, Israel Montalvo, Félix Ortiz, Ángel Rivera, Jesús Ojeda, Julio Mercado, Rigoberto Marrero, Ángel Segarra, Luis Martínez, Ángel Álvarez, Francisco Alicea, Pedro Torruellas, Cándido de la Paz, Ramón S. Vélez Sr., Cruz Martínez, Pedro J. Vangas Sr., Miguel Carrión, Leoncio Puchamp, Ramón Pedraza, Jesús Pedrosa Sr., Felix Rivera. Let's pay our respect for those who have passed away, please, by giving them a moment of silence. Please rise. 
Dr. Melendez will say the final thoughts. Before we go on, it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, uh, a fearless leader of the community in El Barrio. She has been our representative for various terms. Uh, unfortunately, they have term limits. This is the one case in which I, I, will, I will feel the pain uh, when she leaves. But it's my great pleasure to introduce to you the representative for El Barrio. Very proud to be here today. Obviously, I want to acknowledge all the awesome and wonderful work that the Center for Puerto Rican Studies continues to do each and every day to document the contributions of Puerto Ricans here in the United States, obviously here in New York, and the fact that El Centrona finds itself here in El Barrio, la cuna de la comunidad puertorriqueña, means so much to me and it means so much to this community, so thank you, Dr. Melendez, and thank you, Centro for Puerto Rican Studies. And also, uh, obviously, to acknowledge all those that are being honored here today, um, and to our veterans in particular, obviously, since that is the focus of tonight's event, all your contributions, all that you have given, uh, and all the sacrifice. Um, I don't talk about it much, but uh, you know, my father actually was a PFC in the Army. Um, and he was able to get an education based on his having served. My grandfather also was in the US Navy, and they are both buried in the uh, National Cemetery in Puerto Rico. And uh, you know, so we all have given, many of our families have given so much sacrifice. And so it's great that you are being recognized here today. So congratulations to all the honorees. Uh, and uh, as a proud Puerto Rican, born and raised on the island, uh, I really have a deep commitment to El Centro and to everything that it's doing. And this campaign of the 100 Puerto Ricans is so important. And we have to continue to remember what our contributions are. We have to make sure that our children and the next generations understand what we have given, what we have sacrificed to help build this country and to help make our island also a better place and to make the bridges and the connections. Uh, as a Puerto Rican in service and as an elected official, I'm deeply committed to ensuring that we continue to build bonds with the island, that we continue to be supportive in moving the agenda uh, for our island, and the Center for Puerto Rican Studies is also key to that. So again, thank you all for being here. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you to your sacrifice. Uh, and it's great that this honor is happening tonight. So I look forward to the future events. And uh, gracias por su servicio. Gracias. Someone mentioned that the closing remarks are between us and the food, so I'm going to try to be very brief and just uh, thank you, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I would like to uh, to really uh, say that this has gone beyond our expectations when we started organizing all this. Uh, we were uh, sort of, you know, we never done anything with the with the you know veterans and how is this going to go. But I can say that uh, there is a lot of passion for what you do, and anything that we can do to support it, uh, we, we please approach us and we will try to do the best we can. Uh, with your support, Central Library and Archives will continue to be the main source of information on the Puerto Rican community in the United States. When you have a chance, please take a tour downstairs. We, our li library reading room and archives and all the facilities are at the end of that long corridor that you came in. Uh, and I see uh, some of our staff here in the library and they will be more than happy to take you around so you can take a look at uh, the, uh, hmm. unfortunately the archives are in the basement and it's a long stairs, but I'll be happy to find 
uh, guide you through the uh, elevator to get there and, and to show it, because I know it might be a long journey for some. But in any case, you will see for yourself a beautiful reading room. When we honor our legacy, we have a wall of heroines and you know, some people that have really guided the community for years. We have in the, in the, in the archives, we have 24-7 climate control facilities, state-of-the-art stuff. Uh, and we have, you will see the most advanced technologies for scanning stuff, for making uh, microfilms available to the public and so on and so forth. We're very proud of what Hunter uh, College and Cooney have done for us and I invite you to take a look at it so you can share that, that experience with us. I would also like to thank, uh, uh, you know, last thing I would, I'm going to do, I want to thank Anthony Mele and Jim Carr for helping us organize the event and all the honorees tonight for their commitment and for making this event possible and a success. Uh, 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 thanks for your altruism and dedication. We really appreciate it. Uh, I would like to thank also uh, our partner for the Arga Prensa Univision who spread the word and helped us get people to, to the event. I would also like to thank my staff, a bunch of dedicated people, starting with my uh, deepest appreciation to Mayra Torres, my uh, uh, trusted, loyal, dedicated uh, deputy, to Rosani Plaza, who has been coordinator of these affinity events. And uh, this was the first, she was so nervous, and I told her, chill out, this is going to be okay. <laughs> anyway, Evelyn Collazo, who's somewhere in the past, and she puts together all the logistics of this and the food, so when you have a chance, thank her too. Uh, uh, she's our events coordinator, Andres. Uh, Andrea, are you all are around? Andres Ruiz, who uh, worked for the library, have put all these uh, things together from our perspective. Uh, in any case, all our support, uh, all our staff supported the event, and I'm great. Uh, I'm thankful to them for doing all that. Uh, so, last thing I'm going to say is that you please leave your uh, email, uh, postal address, and so forth so that we can invite you to the ceremonies, uh, all the celebrations that we're going to have around the 40th anniversary. We're going to have art exhibits, we're going to have other affinity events for cultural organizations, for women who have, uh, for health people in the health industry, and so on and so forth. We have done two already, one for the Puerto Rican Day Parade presidents, and it was very successful. We have done one for, um, uh, for the labor organizations and the unions and so forth. So we really uh, have a lot to uh, coming up as part of our 40th anniversary. So if you leave your address and you leave your email and that kind of stuff, we will make sure that you get the program that, uh, that we're putting together for, from here on. Uh, be proud, celebrate our heritage. Muchas gracias. We, we have a treat tonight. We just need your attention for one second. Well, you all heard, you heard the National Anthem and the Holy King. But each has a request from Myra. Where is Myra? All right, right. I'm going to dedicate our 65th Infantry Regiment March tonight to my. To Maya, where is she? Huh? All right. Huh? La Marcha de 65. <laughs> and of course, my, my, I have, I have nine children, 25 grandchildren, and 14 great grandchildren. Some of them are here. But this song is for you. It's La Marcha del 65. Para que la recuerden, y le voy a dar copia a ella luego. Dice así. Arriba, muchacho, vamos a zarpar. A dejar la tierra, vamos a pelear. Por los caminos de la ley. Va el regimiento de mi borenque, todo por la patria lo habremos de dar, por madres y hermanos que quedan allá, por la noblecita, el hijo y mi Dios, a la isla querida decimos adiós. 
a Dios tierra dorada de mis anhelos no olvides te hijos en de tus oraciones que yo en mis noches triste con mis canciones podré aliviar la angustia de mi dolor gane o pierda siempre luchar con valor el 65 se cubrió de honor en mil combates y en batallas cien siempre cara al viento marcha el regimiento de mi borinquen de mi borinquen